Yeah. Uh, are you happy with BDD? Yes. Thank you. Good. Okay. See, I'm listening. Okay. So anyhow, there's our numbers and the verses we're singing. You can find them in your hymnal, which is located underneath your chair. And we will go ahead and stand and get started with hymn number 495, 1, verses 1 and 3. Heaven came down. <laughs>
right? You all get an A for the day. Yes. <laughs> okay, next song is uh, page 354. Verses 1 and 3. <coughs> Leaning on the everlasting arms. <coughs> stage tomorrow morning. Uh, hopefully Thursday and Friday we can get it rebuilt so we can be moving back into it. I'm not going to say it's going to be next Sunday because that's our target date, I guess. Hopefully. Uh, so if anybody's a carpenter and wants to throw some nails around or screws or whatever we decide to do, Thursday and Friday I'll be here working on the stage. That's my plan. You're welcome to come. My last communion meditation has been to like, how long? Six months? Quite oh, a while. And I stepped away for a while. I had some personal things I needed to deal with. And um, so I had started the last one doing kind of a series of meditations on 12 steps of AA, which I see as a um, 
it's just a way to see God and, and the power in God and, and the one power, the only power that can save me. So I started a series on that. Anyway, this meditation is lengthy, but the first third of it is going over what I had gone over before because I can't remember. So I had to remind myself, so now I'm reminding you too. So bear with me, please. Uh, in my last communion meditation, I discussed the first step of the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, which says, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. I tried to stress the fact that any sin can replace the word alcohol, that the first step toward a true relationship with God is confession. We might say, I admit that I am powerless over anger or worry, and as a result of that powerlessness, I am struggling to manage my life. What does unmanageability look like? This is how it's described in the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. We were having trouble with personal relationships. We couldn't control our emotional natures. We were a prey to misery and depression. We couldn't make a living. We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. We were unhappy. We couldn't seem to be of real help to other people. Few of us meet all of those criteria at any given point in time, but I imagine that most of us have met some of those criteria at some point during our lives. My original AA step work focused on the sin of addiction, but the sin in my life is not a singular event. I recognize this better today than I did when I first got sober and worked through the steps. I am powerless over most of the things in my life that trouble me, or to get to the root of my problem, I have no power over my sinful nature. I also have no power over your sinful nature. Though the recognition of that fact does not prevent your failures from troubling me, or stop me from criticizing the wrong I see in you. Like all human beings, I inherited this nature of sinfulness from my ancestors, Adam and Eve, their gift to me resulting from their rebellion toward their creator. I carry on their penchant for lawlessness and am guilty of my own rebellion toward God. I remind myself of the Apostle Paul, who said in chapter 7 of the book of Romans, I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do I do not do, but what I hate I do. If only we could see, as Paul did, that our human existence is an opportunity for transformation, a chance to change from reckless rebels to redeemed radicals. Paul lived out his faith and died defending it, beheaded in Rome, according to historical texts, martyred for his dedication to Jesus Christ. That is a revolutionary change for a man who once thought his life's role was to persecute and imprison Christians. For 2,000 years, Paul's writings have been moving and guiding those of us that form the church body. Today, just as much as in Paul's time, God seeks men and women who will recognize and fulfill the responsibility of pointing people toward Christ. I've described 12-step work as a journey from selfishness to selflessness, from godlessness to godfulness. That description is not an implication that because I have worked through the steps that I am either selfless or godful. I am neither one of those. I do not know anyone who has done step work perfectly and would run from anyone who made such a claim. Our salvation journeys are marathons, not sprints. In our recovery groups, we encourage progress, not perfection. I needed, and continue to need, a simple and practical way to get rid of my mistakes. Not to pass them by, but to learn from them so that the odds are increased that I will not repeat the error. My friend Scott Lee says, a mistake is just an opportunity for a lesson. Each step we take and every mistake we make in our unique journey is necessary for our transformation, and each lesson builds on the ones that come before it. The mistake of submitting to my sinful desires separates me from God. When there is distance between God and me, I create that distance. My separation from God is always a result of something I have done, something I am doing, or something I refuse to do. God seeks us to save us from ourselves, that is a fact, but that is not his end. His goal is a mutual relationship of love and affection. Our Creator wants us to know Him as our Father. He needs us to know that we are His children. Trust is an absolute in all relationships, and I would argue that any relationship not founded upon it is destined for failure. Therefore, in order to embark on a journey of a true relationship with God, I must be honest about my inability to overcome the things that harm my spirit. Until I can see the truth about myself, I had nothing to give to God. The truth in us speaks to Him. Confessing our failures is the first step toward the healing that only He can provide. 
And now my next key invitation. <laughs> the second step says, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. I have heard the came to believe portion of the step broken down like this. I came, I came to, I came to believe. Are you looking to see how thick that is? I saw you. I went to A. I went to AA because my life was falling apart. I also came to church because my life was falling apart. I came to this specific church because someone invited me. I would not have come to Northside or gone to any other church without an invitation. I thought of myself as too damaged to be welcome in a place like this. Besides, I had been to church before, just as I had been to AA before, although I never really wanted to go to either one. I just wanted the negative consequences of my poor choices to stop. I wanted the self-inflicted pain again. Despite my attendance at church and AA at different times throughout my many years of alcoholism and drug addiction, I always relapsed back into sin because I never took seriously any of the recommendations I heard at either place. Recommendations like confession, baptism, Bible study, meditation, and prayer. To be honest with you, there are still days I do not want to come to church. But I also never want to leave the church, if that makes any sense. Because of relapse into sin, I have experienced the emotional internal chaos that ensues when I stay away from church for a significant amount of time. In 1997, after my wife had left with our eight-month-old daughter to seek a safe place away from me, I attended a local church to try to get sober and save my marriage. I went through baptism and accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Not long after, I returned to my life of addiction, falling ever faster into debauchery until I landed in prison. Jesus taught about this in Matthew 12, 43 through 45, where he says, When an evil spirit comes out of a man who goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it, then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house empty, swept clean, and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. They go in and live there. And the final condition of that man is worse than the first. When I meet someone who is suffering with his or her sinfulness, instead of just saying, I will be praying for you. I'm trying to become a man that is not afraid of rejection when I invite him or her to church. I do not say that to minimize the importance of prayer. I say it to maximize the importance of church attendance. Few of us show up here on a winning streak. Many of us would not have shown up at all without an invite. And the importance of worshipful fellowship for the spurring on of one's belief in God cannot be overstated. We need each other. The came to portion of came to believe re 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 represents to me the awakening that happens for those of us who seek salvation. In 2009, not long before I got sober, one of my dad's best friends pulled me out of the restaurant we were dining at and said to me, Greg, when I look into your eyes, all I see is darkness. Can't you see that you're killing your soul? Addiction had robbed me of all that was good in life and was slowly eating away my spirit. When I came to Northside, I was dying a spiritual death. But when I put the things that I learned here into practice, my life changed. Paul speaks of this in Ephesians chapter 2 where he says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, and the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. That's the key, it is by grace we have been saved. After 11 years here, I can tell you that one of my greatest joys is to witness the work of God's grace and the sunlight of his spirit as it chases away the darkness that is apparent in the eyes of every sinner that walks through our doors. To those of us whose frequent companion is spiritual darkness, Jesus says this in the book of John, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. George MacDonald, one of my favorite Christian apologists, says this, With vivid flashes of life and truth, his words invade our darkness, rousing us with sharp stings of light to will our awakening to arise from the dead, to cry for the light which he can give, not in the lightning of words only, but in indwelling presence and power. I remain amazed by the concept of God's desire to dwell within us. 
that he patiently and lovingly stands at the outer side of the closed door of our hearts, <coughs> waiting for us to wake up, open up, and let him enter. The came to believe portion of this step represents to me the hope that exists within the church, the vision of it, maybe the first vision of it for some of us. Ken Cross, one of the founders of Cocaine Anonymous, says that at one of the first AA meetings he attended, he saw a dirty, disheveled, nervous-looking man in the back row. At some point during the meeting, the man stood up and told the group how he had recently relapsed. He was full of remorse, wished he could die, and needed a shower. But at the end of sharing his story, he said, I came back here because I know that this is where the hope is. Church should be the place where sinners know the hope is, the place where hope shines brightest. Hope is the seed that sprouts into belief, and belief, when properly nourished, grows into faith. It is our faith in Christ that ultimately saves our souls. We can summarize Ken Cross's book. We can summarize came to believe in this way. I showed up, I woke up, and I opened up. Being open-minded toward the idea of a God whose will is our well-being is crucial, crucial at this stage of our growth. The fact that we came to church this morning implies that we believe in God. But even we have different ideas of what that means. What about faith? Do we all have the same type and amount of faith in Christ just because we call ourselves Christians? Did Peter, who climbed out of the boat and tried to walk on the water, have the same amount of faith as Thomas, who not only did not step out of the boat, but also had to stick his hand in the lacerated side of Christ before he would believe that he had risen from the dead? Our faiths are as numerous as we are, and there is nothing wrong with that. But if we are going to become sharers of the gospel, as God intends us to be, we are bound to meet some who struggle with the concept of a higher power, people whose belief is either feeble or non-existent. Non-believers can be frustrating for those of us who believe in God, and they are precisely the folks that God sends us out to influence. This is from Acts chapter 26. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. But you consider that you might be the only messenger from God that some sinner might meet. Are you confident in your ability to, pro to proclaim God's existence and his great love for humanity? God is constantly and eternally at work in our lives, from within and from without in the past, present, and future. His creative spirit designed the plant life that absorbs the carbon dioxide we exhale and converts it to the oxygen we inhale. He keeps Earth just the right distance from the sun, traveling at the perfect speed, spin, and tilt so that we neither boil nor freeze to death. He makes our eyes blink, our lungs breathe, and our hearts beat. He blesses us with his Holy Spirit so that we can feel his presence within, even when without all is doom, gloom, and chaos. From the smell of a puppy's breath to the view of a breathtaking sunset, God's gifts of loving kindness surround us every moment of every day. But one of Satan's greatest weapons is his ability to dim our view, to alter our perceptions. What many of us tend to lack is vision. Inundated by the daily dose of bad news presented to us by mass media, and the immersion of ourselves into the lives of others on apps like Instagram and Facebook, we become unable or unwilling to see the goodness of God. Can you see that God is good? That our lives are a blessing born of his grace? Can you help others to see it? Although God's miracles might appear to be more subtle today than they were when Christ turned water into wine or fed thousands of people with a few fish, they are nevertheless happening among us. I can point out several sitting in this room right now. People who have sought God and found sanity because they confess their need for God's forgiveness. People who are grateful to God for the way he has transformed their lives and because of that gratitude are dedicated to helping others recover from their sinful past. The final portion of step two regards restoration to sanity. If restored to sanity sounds like extreme language, then listen to Albert Einstein's definition, and you can read along if you know it. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Does that describe the sins in your life? Are they repetitive acts, despite the knowledge of their destructive potential? That is my story. A more fitting definition of my insanity would be doing the same thing over and over, 
knowing exactly what the result is going to be and doing it anyway. To allow anger to consume me until I explode in fits of rage is insane behavior. To return to the use of drugs after suffering the negative consequences of drug use is insane behavior. To worry after suffering from worrying or suffering because worrying did not solve the problem being worried about is insane behavior. <laughs> Uncontrolled anger, drug abuse, and worrying are all sins that separate us from the love of God. A thousand years before Christ was born, King Solomon spoke of this in Proverbs 26, 11, where he wrote, As a dog returns to its vomit, so fools repeat their folly. Last page. God desires to free us from such foolishness. For myself, I wanted instant relief as, as Christ gave the crippled man when he told him, Take up your mat and walk. My release from bondage was more of the educational variety. Freedom from sin was not instantaneous for me. It is ongoing. I wanted Jesus to tell me, pick up your mat and walk, but what he says is, pick up your cross daily and follow me. Salvation for this sinner does not appear to be a one and done deal. It is a discipline that will require maintenance all of my life. We cannot change this nature of sinfulness that we inherited from Adam and Eve. The only entity with any power over our sinful natures is God. In a seemingly strange and mystical way, God sent his son, not to give us a new nature. That comes during the construction of our lives lived in obedience to Christ. Jesus came to put into us a new heredity, the inheritance of righteousness and virtue, if we will let him. That is the key for our side of this relationship, finding within ourselves the willingness to let God make the men and women of us that he meant us to be. I ask, are you crazy with some sin or sins in your life? If you answer yes, then arise from the dead and cry out for God's light. He is anxiously waiting for you to ask him for help. Are you awakening to the fact that God's will is your well-being? Then praise God. You are a most loved child of the Most High God. Decide today to let him perform his work in you. Believe in the power of God to destroy sin through the death and resurrection of his son. This is the Apostle Paul in the first chapter of his first letter to the Corinthians. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 800 years before Christ was born, the prophet Isaiah said, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. As we receive the bread and cup this morning, our symbols of remembrance for what Christ has done for us, believe, or at least begin to believe, in the power of the love of God shed abroad for us in the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We pray. God, we give you the glory. You are almighty, you are all powerful. Help us to remember that. Help us to lean on that when we find ourselves in moments of turmoil, emotionally, physically, all of those things that are bound to come our way in this life, Lord. Help us to remember you and to lean on you first and instead of last, which tends to be my pattern. We love you. We thank you for all that you've done for us, especially for your son, who we remember now as we receive the bread that represents his body and the juice that represents his blood. We just ask Christ that you would give us more of your personality, that you would help us to become more like you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
this in here makes it more crowded and more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Pray again. Mm. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for today. We thank you for your son. We thank you for all the good things that you've done for us. We thank you also for the consequences that tend to drive us back toward you when we make wrong choices. We thank you for all that you have blessed us with, Lord. You, you truly do give us an abundance. And we come now to offer part of that back to you, uh, to the church, to do your work, uh, hopefully to do your will. Guide us as we use these gifts. For the further, the furthering of your church, for the growth of your kingdom, in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. being in here instead of in there too much. I appreciate the hope that we'll be able to move back into the other part uh, soon, but um, I think I think it doesn't depend upon our building or physical circumstances whether God shows up or not. Amen. I have appreciated the, oh, it's children's church time. I've appreciated the effort that you've made to uh, encourage one another in spite of whatever circumstances are going on around us. It's been apparent. I want to thank Greg for the communion meditation. Probably one of the best sermons I think I've ever heard. <laughs> and I don't mean that as any kind of slam. Um, seriously. I appreciate what you had to share. And <laughs> it's a God thing. I don't know how he could have said uh, anything that would have complimented what I'm about to say anymore. Let's get started. The theme for Northside 2023 is which comes from John 8, 12, which Greg already read. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The title of today's sermon is Your Heart Health. And I'm not talking about the blood pumping organ in your chest, but the heart the Bible talks about when it says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow all the issues of life. Also, the hope that is deferred makes the heart sick. I'm talking about the heart Jesus referred to when he said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart. And the Spirit of the Lord is on me to bind up the brokenhearted. The Bible heart is the combination of your mind, will, and emotions. So then, a sermon about your heart health is about your mental and emotional health. How balanced are you mentally? <laughs> and how stable are you emotionally? Well, truth is, we're all nuts. 
crazy, insane Amen. to some degree. But some of us are nuttier than others. <laughs> and I'm not saying who. <laughs> we are all emotionally unstable at times. And we need to be encouraged. Mental and emotional health is on a continuum. And it's constantly changing. It is hard and next to impossible to stay balanced and level. I don't know about you, but I'm usually about a half a bubble off. So is a lot of bubble off. I'm laughing too loud. She thinks the grading of the curve. <laughs> Thankfully. <laughs> It's a fuzzy line between mental health and illness. Are you familiar with the DSM? The Diagnostic and, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual published by the American Psychiatric Association, which the current edition lists 297 mental disorders. One of these is called Bipolar Affective Disorder, which is characterized by violent mood swings from being immobilized by depression to burst of manic energy. The cause and cure for this condition, as with 97% of the problems listed in the DSM, are largely unknown. But one thing is for sure, we all need hope. We all need an anchor for our souls. We all need Jesus. Amen. Hebrews chapter 6, one of the scriptures I've listed on the whiteboard. Hebrews chapter 6. Reading verses 17 through 20. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, What's the two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie? His word repeated. He said it, and he said he's going to do it. God doesn't lie. And so by two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. The physical, psychological, and spiritual are interrelated in us because we are body soul, and spirit. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who has called you is faithful, and he will do it. So let's talk about your feelings. If thinking is centered in the brain, feeling is centered in the gut. We talk about gut feelings. It can be good or bad. Do you have bowels of compassion for those who are in trouble? On the other hand, is it true that sometimes your stomach is all tied up in knots when you're 
in trouble. Feelings can be good or bad. Love or hate, joy or sadness, trust or fear, peace and contentment, or anger and resentment. But in general, the emotions that you struggle with are common to man and are not sinful or shameful. This is a guilt-free zone. I came across a Facebook post, which was a repost from May of 2022. It was entitled IDC. I didn't know what that would be about, but I got it when I read the post. Someone, a woman, wrote, and I quote, when I get depressed, I don't clean, I don't cook, and I don't care, IDC. I let myself go. Some women don't understand or approve of me. They cook and clean no matter how they feel. I say, good for you. But some of us can't. Some of us can't even get out of bed. And if we do, it is a battle. But we also can't talk about it. Because if we do, we're judged, looked down on, and told to get with it, because that's what a real woman would do, end quote. <clears throat> this woman is being honest, I think, <clears throat> and also saying something very important about those of us who would judge others because of bad feelings that they have. We feel what we feel, and if we feel we can't talk about bad feelings, we feel even worse. We need someone who understands and cares. We need hope. We need an anchor for our souls. We need a friend who's closer than a brother. We need Jesus. Hebrews again, chapter 4. Verse 14 through 16 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who's gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Please, if anyone dares to share their emotional baggage with you, try to be like Jesus. Honesty about your feelings is a guilt free zone. For example, if you repress anger and feel guilty for being angry, you will likely become depressed. Depression is the common cold of the heart. Everyone experiences it to a greater or lesser degree. It may be fear of failure or further loss that immobilizes you or in times of trouble, you may doubt the goodness of God, but it is a guilt-free zone. Be aware, however, that it is also a caution zone. Oops, upside down. <laughs> Your heart is a caution zone. God said to Cain, Why are you angry? 
Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. And Jesus told us that anger is the precursor to murder. Paul wrote, be angry, but do not sin. James reminds us that the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. If you don't know how to resist the devil and wallow in bad feelings, you will lose your peace, hope, and joy. The key to your feelings is your thinking. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I like to use, in talking about feelings, the chain. Uh, the uh, train illustration. Imagine in your mind an old steam engine. You've got the engine, you've got the fuel car, and you've got the caboose. That's how old longer my train is. <laughs> <laughs> the feelings, your feelings are the caboose of your life. Your faith is the fuel car. What you believe produces the feelings that follow. But what drives the train is not the fuel car, it's the engine, which are the facts. The facts are followed by your faith, and your faith is followed by your feelings. They all interact. Feelings flow from faith, faith flows from facts, and the facts I'm referring to are the facts about God and His Son, Jesus Christ. I'm talking about the gospel that saves us. What you believe about God, what you believe about Jesus, will determine how you feel about every and any, any and every situation. In 1 Corinthians 13, 11, Paul said, when I was a child, I thought as a child. I can't quote it, I gotta find it. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. Paul said, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. <clears throat> That's a necessary beginning. But you must grow in the knowledge, grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ if you want to be mentally healthy and emotionally stable. If you want the light of life, you have to follow Jesus. If you want to have good feelings to buoy you up in the midst of trouble, then you must be renewed in your mind, in your thinking. Let's talk about your thinking. There's two verses that I want you to look at. The first is Colossians 3, 2. And the second is Philippians <clears throat> chapter 4. First Colossians 3, 2. I'm going to start at verse 1. Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. What are we supposed to set, our, set on things above in that verse? Hearts. Verse 2 says minds. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. You see how he separates in these two verses heart from mind. Mind, I've told you, is a part of your vital heart. 
but it is separated out here for a reason. Because thinking, how you think, what you believe, determines how, how you feel, and how you feel determines what you're going to say and do, largely. So he separates your mind out and makes a point to say, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Philippians 4 is the other passage, does the same thing, separates out heart or mind from heart. Philippians 4, I'm reading verse 6 through 9. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He goes on to talk about what you think about. Verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And it's, it's so important to have right uh, thinking, right living, model in front of you. He goes on to say, whatever you've learned, or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. You are a composite of heaven and earth. You are made of clay, a little lower than angels. You are made in the image of God to rule over the earth. But something is wrong, isn't it? Because at present we do not see everything subject to man. And this, of course, is because of sin. Having entered the world, this world is under a curse and is passing away. But God, praise God, he is at work making everything new, starting with you and me. Romans chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The things of this earth pull us down. But the things of heaven lift us up. And so I say grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. The grace or charis is a New Testament emphasis. The peace or shalom is an Old Testament emphasis. And the grace and peace <coughs> of God and, of, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's only in Christ that we have these, this peace. The word shalom is interesting. It means wholeness. It means soundness. <coughs> it means healthy. The peace that passes understanding is what God is offering to you. And it doesn't come because you pray one prayer or, or, or uh, do have some kind of uh, uh, good luck charm or whatever. The peace that passes understanding comes as you pray about everything with all prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, and the peace of God that passes all understanding can be yours. It is a commitment to Christ that is faithful unto death. And I'm looking here at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. 
which says, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled, set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when <laughs> Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. Hebrews uh, chapter 12 encourages us with these words. Hebrews 12, verse 1, 2 and 3 say, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. One more, Romans chapter 5. Verse 1 following, Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, everyone here that's been justified through faith, raise your hand. Some of you are in doubt. <laughs> maybe, maybe you haven't been, because you have not <coughs> obeyed the gospel yet. But if you've been justified through faith, we have, it says we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also <laughs> rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. <clears throat> I want to wrap this up by referring to the lives of David and Saul in the scriptures listed first from 1 Samuel. In 1 Samuel 13, we see that Saul began to disobey God. He offered a burnt offering to God, asking for God's protection and guidance against their enemies, against the Israelite enemies. Uh, but he shouldn't have done that. That was Samuel's place to offer the burnt offering. But Saul became impatient, and he wasn't willing to wait on the Lord. And so he offered this burnt offering offering which caused God's prophet Samuel to tell Saul that because you've disobeyed your dynasty will no, not last forever and then in 1 Samuel 15 Saul disobeys God again by not completely destroying an enemy of Israel as God had told him to do and then the prophet Samuel tells King Saul, because you've disobeyed, because you have rebelled, the kingdom is going to be taken away from you, not just one of your descendants, but from you. And God will have chosen someone else to be king. And that someone else was David, wasn't it? Because God had disobeyed God, he was out of fellowship with God. He became mentally ill. Actually, the book of 1 Samuel talks about how there was an evil spirit from God that tormented him. I'm reading from 1 Samuel 16. It says, The spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's attendant said, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the harp. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes upon you, and you will feel better. 
And so Saul said to his attendants, find someone who plays well and bring him to me. And that someone was <coughs> the young shepherd boy, David, who, whom Samuel had already anointed as the next king of Israel to replace Saul. Um, verse I don't know where did I read uh, 1 Samuel 16 21 and so David came to Saul and entered his service Saul liked him very much and David became one of his armor bearers and it says, whenever the Spirit from God came upon Saul, David would take his harp and play. Then relief would come to Saul. He would feel better, and the evil spirit would leave him. But then chapter 17 is all about David becoming famous in Israel for having killed Goliath. And the women, when David came back from that victory, the women sang this song. Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. This is chapter 18. Look at verse 8 with me of 18. <clears throat> Saul was very angry. This refrain galled him. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully upon Saul. He was prophesying in his house while David was playing the harp, as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice because he tried to do that twice to kill David when David was ministering to Saul's troubled spirit. You know, reading on in the book, turn to 1 Samuel 24. I'll read there for a minute. Saul tried to kill David twice. Isn't it ironic that David had a chance to kill Saul twice? Let's read about it. 1 Samuel 24, verse 6 says, David said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointer, and lift up my hand against him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. Verse 12. <clears throat> may the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evil doers come evil deeds, so my hand will not touch you. Chapter 26 is the second occasion when he could have killed Saul. Let's read what he says there in 1 Samuel 26, verse 9. <clears throat> David said to Abishai, don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and remain guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him. Either his time will come and he will die, or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and water jug and let's go. Because they were standing right there with him, with Saul asleep in front of him. And he could have, Abishai wanted to put a spear through his body. Or, but David said to Abishai, no. And David refused to take vengeance against Saul because he trusted the Lord and because he allowed the word of God to shape his thinking. Did you see it as I read how he recognized that Saul had been chosen by God to be king? And if Saul was not going to be king anymore, that would be God's choice. He was not going to take matters into his own hand, even though he had been told that he was going to be king. <clears throat> the end of the story is that Saul in his demented mind 
knows that God is not with him. And so when time of crisis comes, he consults a witch or a medium to try to get guidance and some hope. But he doesn't get any hope from that. And he ends up uh, being wounded in battle and then killing himself. He falls on his own sword. After which David doesn't say, see, I told you. No, David mourns, grieves for the loss of Saul. What does that tell you about this man, David? A man after God's own heart. A man who thought right. And so he did right. No matter how he felt. And believe me, with Saul chasing around the country for I don't know how many years, I'm sure he was tired of that. He could have justifiably been, been angry with Saul. But he left it in God's hands. So that's an illustration from the scriptures about mental health and illness. David, the example of mental health. Saul, the example of mental illness. They're in place because we're coming to an invitation song. It's going to be one, number 190. It's going to be the first two verses of Are You Worst in Blood? Let me just say that mental and emotional illnesses are real problems that are difficult to deal with. But the biggest problem is not trying to deal with mental illness, but trying to deal with it without God. Without Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals us. So follow Jesus and you'll have the light of life. Receive his spirit and he will produce the fruit of the spirit in you. If you follow Jesus with all your heart, you will have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us follow. Keep in step with the Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. This song is an invitation <laughs> for you to make whatever commitment you want to make to Jesus Christ. That may be a first-time commitment where you confess that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and are baptized in his name. It may be a, one of these ongoing commitments that we make to read our Bible and pray like we know we ought to do, to become involved in a local congregation that's engaged in the work of the Lord. In any case, this is the invitation song and your opportunity to respond as we sing, Are You Worshipped in the Blood? many of you from when you attended together uh, church uh, in Brownstown. But she's been a longtime member of First Christian Church Brownstown, but she's been coming here for some time now and, uh, and lives here in Vandalia. And she has come forward this morning to place her membership with this congregation. So uh, uh, I think I think when she first started attending, she was just checking us out. <laughs> and I, think, I think that she has decided that this is a safe place and a good place to, to be, uh, to find God. So uh, we're going to uh, take a, her confession, statement of faith again, like she's made many.
for many years. Mm -hmm. I don't know, when were you first baptized? Okay. Um, that's been a while. <laughs> that you know how to make a good confession, too. Would you um, say to everyone again that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the Living God? I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the Living God. God bless you for that confession of faith. It encourages us to do the same, and we welcome you then as a member of Northside Christian Church. <laughs> Yeah, we have one more verse to sing. Is anybody else who wants to make a decision here as we sing? Second. Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? Are you washing Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time together. I thank you for being with us uh, by your Spirit through the worship uh, service here and also uh, by in our hearts. And you've moved Deanna to make this uh, commitment to this local congregation. And I pray that uh, it'll be good for her and good for us and good for this community. When that we are uh, one mind and one heart and may our hearts indeed be uh, guarded by your spirit against the evil one I pray in Jesus name Amen, Amen. Amen. Amen.